Hey guys, it's Stu again from Touch Leaps. Uh, and today I thought we'd go through Ableton writing tips and tricks that um, I use all the time, every day, for making sample packs, uh, for writing library music, for writing my own music, quality of life things that you might already know or you might not. So let's go through them. Uh, they're all quite simple, but I find that when you stack them all up together, they are really, really good time saving tricks. So yeah, let's get into it. So the first one uh, is a really simple one and it's just having templates set up. I don't think there's anything that kills creativity more than having to constantly go up to this window here and scrub through the instruments, audio effects, MIDI effects until you find whatever you're looking for and you've got to drag it in and then you've got to let it load. And yeah, once a project starts to get a certain size, that can really start to slow down. So yeah, having it all prepared and laid out from the start uh, can be a, a lifesaver. So what I have here is the template that I use for making a sample pack. What I have are 10 groups. And within each of those groups, we have a beat, percussion, bass, uh, two melody, and a pad uh, channel. And all I really have to do to make a pack is fill in these tracks and do it 10 times. For example, I'll load up this template, open up the beat channel. I've already got a drum rack preloaded in. I have an EQ, an auto pan, compressor, and utility always ready to go on all my channels, MIDI or audio, just to save time. So I can quickly just load sounds in, arrange them how I like. And it's a, it just saves so much time not having to load each one of these things in for every channel. And to do that, all you need to do is right click on the channel and at the bottom you'll have save as default MIDI track or default audio track. So we have the beat one there and then we have percussion, uh, an arpeggiator, although, you know, you might draw this in by hand. Um, I've already loaded in a percussion here, which we'll get back to in a bit. Uh, bass is just a simpler, but obviously wherever you'll go to bass sound sources, uh, whether it's an external synth, you could just have an external input here, or maybe it's a plugin. Having it preloaded, uh, save so much time and again all of these four uh, melody they're both the same and then also on these melodies I have a sidechain compressor set up because almost undoubtedly at some point I'm going to start sidechaining the music to the beat channel here so that's all set up and ready to go and as you can see it's already set up to receive an input from that beat here the beat channel and then a couple of one shot things here just to start building up a one shot collection that's one and then I just do that 10 more times and by the time I've got to 10 there, I've got, and you know, um, you kind of, that's one, this is two, three, four. By the time I've got to the bottom, I've already put together maybe 60, 50, 60 loops. Um, all in one place, which means that my master channel has all the, I only have a spectrum and a limiter on here, but um, I would probably also load this up with uh, a, a limit, a, a, a plug-in limiter, maybe uh, some kind of tape emulation i like to have something like that on the master just to give everything a nice warmth um and maybe uh, another compressor or something um but all of it then is going through the same master which means once i've exported all of this out it will uh, all sound relatively similar as opposed to having lots of different sessions scattered all over the place so next let's jump into some of the things you can do in simpler which i think are quick and really help bring arrangements to life uh, so I've got a MIDI MIDI track set up here. I'm just going to put a little clip in on C3. C3, by the way, is where the sample will play back at its original pitch. Um, you can jump up an octave by holding down Shift, Command, and Up, and we'll jump up to C4, or uh, Shift, Command, and Down, and we can go down to C2, which will make the sound an octave lower. So from there, if we go back into Simpler, I've just got this sound here loaded up. sort of a tapey, could be a hi-hat kind of thing. But if you go into controls, there's quite a lot you can do with the sound here without having to go into any of the other effects on this channel, uh, the EQ or the auto pan. The one that I find the quickest and most effective is random pan here. So I'm going to play the sound. And as we go up to 100, it will randomly, well, start panning the sound from left to right. Having that at about... Mm, 50-ish is I can't tell you how how 
quickly uh, a mix has been fixed by just randomly moving hi-hats out of the way. I mean, it doesn't work for everything. Obviously, low-end sounds, you probably want those to be down the middle, but uh, hi-hat sounds or any kind of texture sound. Um, and even, you know, having it just down to sort of 20 just spreads the sound out of the way, gives everything a bit of movement, a bit of life. Really, really, really useful. And then switching the filter to high-pass here and then pulling down. Like a sound like this, for example, could have quite a lot of low end buried away which we don't want when we come to mixing so we can just roll a lot of that off right away and then if you wanted to add even more character more movement uh i'll turn resample off and just up the pitch here not much i mean you can you can push it a little harder with uh, percussion sounds because they uh you know they're not going to go out of key a little bit maybe one percent and again you can move the pan around here and maybe even the volume just a little bit and keeping the lfo quite slow um things like this already just within simpler we've managed to really add some subtle character and movement to just one hi-hat sound if you're, especially if you're going for that kind of human played feel, this is a quick way of just stopping it sounding like a clearly repeating sample and something that has a bit more life. So next, keeping this uh, human feel in mind, if you go into MIDI effects, and I know this is pretty well trodden ground by now, but velocity and add some random is pretty incredible. So we add this before our arpeggiator, um, or anywhere before I simple it, and we can close off the range, the, ver the the velocity value of the sample. So without having to load in uh, a louder and a quieter hi-hat, say if you don't have those, we can set a range here. So from, let's say, you know, 70 up to 100 with random on about 30, it's going to play back each of these uh uh, hits at a slightly different velocity, which can do wonders for bringing a percussion line to life. Combined with what we've already got here, it's subtle, but really, really, really useful. Again, it's getting a lot of mileage out of one sound. Okay, for this next bit, I've moved on to a, a different session to show you how uh, to manage a session when it starts to get near the end of the track uh, and you're running, I'm running here about 56 channels deep, which for most, you know, high-end Macs isn't going to be a problem. But I'm running kind of an old MacBook Pro and if you are too, there are loads of issues you can run into with CPU later on um, or just navigating around your session can become quite overwhelming so here's what i do when i get to about this stage i'll put everything into groups so i mean you may have been doing this all along uh but it's a great way of saving cpu power if instead of having effects on every single one of these channels like earlier you can put them just on the group um and then it'll you know apply that effect to everything within that group and you can load up one instead of in this case 14 uh, 10 to 14 individual instances of that effect and secondly it's nicer to look at so i've condensed this session here down from you know 56 channels into drums pads risers bass vocals synths textures and organics and then furthermore once you've got to this stage and you've basically finished writing everything i like to then group everything so far into one big group and i like to make auxes I think of now as being just the simplest and quickest way of mixing the track. Um, you could go through and export everything into a new session and mix it there, but I found that creating auxes within this same session keeps everything neat and tidy and easier to archive and stuff. So uh, to set up an aux, you take the group output, send it to the channel you've created, drum aux in this instance, and then this is just an audio channel and I'll set the input to drums, that drum group. So the audio isn't going anywhere else. It's going straight from drums straight into the drum orcs. 
uh, I've then set that it's an input so that we can monitor that input. And I've set the level to minus 10. So the reason it's set to minus 10 is while I was writing, I've been hitting the master pretty hard, uh, not paying too much attention to, to anything. I've got a limiter on there, so it's not going to clip. But now that I'm getting into mixing, I want to drop the volume of everything in this session so that before I've even begun to move levels around, I'm going to have plenty of headroom to work with. So all of these auxes are set to minus 10. So yeah, so I have all these setups, drums, pads, risers, bass, vocals, synths, textures, and organics. And I can quickly then turn these on or off depending on what I want to be listening to, how I want to mix things. And then I group that, close it out of the way so I don't have to look at that anymore. And I'm just looking at this. So another uh, issue with CPU overloading is uh, having too many instances of things running, too many plugins or external sounds or um, processes running. Freezing audio can really, really help you with that. So I have an ARP here and some keys. They're, they're um, uh, plugins. So right click. This is already frozen, so it says unfreeze, but that will say freeze. And you're no longer running all of those processes on that channel. You're just hearing Ableton snapshot of it as a audio file, which will absolutely save you if you start to get to this point in a session where things are overloading. And then furthermore, you can flatten that track to audio. Um, so I'll do that now, um, which can still take a second, but there we go. Now it's just audio. I used to say this arrangement here. If I wanted this sound here, which I think is just sort of a shaker sound, if I wanted that to not be playing later on in the track, I would just delete the clip here and not have it. What I've definitely started doing now, though, is just turning the sound off rather than deleting it. Partly because, and maybe some of you are the same, if I get to around this stage in a track where the structure's mostly done, I'm just kind of tweaking, or maybe I'm having a hard time finding a way of picking the pace back up or moving things around a little, I find having things turned off rather than deleted means I can just quickly turn it back on and see how that sound uh, plays in this new section of the track. Um, it's such a tiny thing, but when I delete the audio before, I would just forget it's there. So like if I'm zoomed in like this, and I'm working on a bunch of things, and I just want one sound to be different, I want something to be like a shaker to come in to pick things up, I can see that there was something here in the earlier version of this section, and I can just turn it on, preview it, and there we go. It's what I was looking for. Um, I didn't need to import a new sound. I already had the sound earlier, and I've just brought it back in. Um, so it's a small thing, and uh, maybe it doesn't sound that <laughs> interesting when I say it, but having sounds turned off but having the shape of the clip still there i found made it way easier to add old ideas back in at the end of a track rather than hunting around for new ones so last thing for now um i've loaded in a mini loop here from the jazz chords pack that uh, i made about a year ago and really it's specifically to do with how you export uh loops whether to use yourself or for a sample company um, if you have return sends from your MIDI or your uh, source of your of your patch, um, and then you go to export that sound uh, before resampling it in Ableton, you'll get this effect where the uh, the reverb or delay that you're sending it to will just cut off at the start because you're not resampling it with that reverb tail caught again at the beginning. Um, so I have here just a folder called Perfect Loops full of resample audio channels. So just audio channels that are set to resampling. Um, and then before exporting uh, this loop, I'm just going to capture it. And there, the tail at the end, you could hear it spilling back over the start. So I would... Uh, run through that twice so the what was just about to record here the second pass of it will be the one that i then crop here and export because it will have a tail uh, at the start from the end so it will loop much much better um uh, across more and more bars and you won't keep getting this bizarre uh, drying out of the sound at the start of every loop 
There you go, guys. Just a few quick tips. I'll do a bunch of these videos. Don't worry. So if there's anything I think of or anything that you suggest that you think people would find helpful or if you have questions within Ableton that you would like us to kind of jump into, just let us know and we'll include them in future videos. Uh, so yeah, cheers, guys. Bye.